yourself and, and all those. Where do you go in search of truth? All sorts of doctrine are in front of you. Where do you go when you be peace? Trouble around you when your soul is weak. Back to the Bible, there I will see. Back to the Bible, what God has for me. Back to the Bible, there I will find. Back to the Bible, truth and peace of mind. Back to the Bible.
morning, church. Let us begin to pray. Great God in heaven, Lord of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, it's once again we approach your throne of grace, mercy, and, and love with thanksgiving in our heart. Thanking you for the God for last night laying down. Thank you for touching us with your finger of love. Waking us up to see a new day. A day we have never seen before and a day we'll never see again. And for that we are grateful and thankful. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to gather in this place one more time. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Sending our praises to you as you send blessing down to us. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your love, your hope, your assurance. Thank you for being the source of our resources. Thank you for your spirit. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Father God, we thank you for the cross and we thank you for the blood. Lord, we pray much for those who are sick and shut in that you render healing to their body. And we pray, Father God, that you will comfort those who are bereaving at this time. Father God, we pray for our friends and visitors who are worshiping us today. Pray for those who are home, Father God, cannot make it, would like to. Pray for them, too, Father God. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our family. Father God, we pray for those who have gone astray, that they will return before it's everlasting too late. Pray also, Father God, for those who do not know you at this time, that they might do so before it's too late. Father God, we pray much for our minister, Dr. Washington. Thank you to bless him, give him good health and long life. Pray much for his wife, Sister Dolores Washington. Father God, we pray for your church as an old. Pray for this world that we're living in. That is just so much tension around us, Father God. We pray, Lord God, that the leader's heart will be in your hands. That we'll do right in your sight. Father God, we pray at this time. For our visiting preacher, Brother Hinton, please, Father God, bless him, bless his family and his ministry. And Lord, please give him a recollection of the thing that he studied, that he will impart it unto us that we might live thereby and tell others that the way of the cross still leads on. Father God, we just thank you again for this day. If we take 10,000 pounds to thank you, it will still not be enough. Father God, we just love you. For loving us so much that you gave your only begotten son that we might have arrived to salvation. And in his name we pray and ask all these things together. Let the church say amen. amen. The march of Zion. Amen. Come we there. Cheers to that. 
And that's Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. And it reads as follows. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that have made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. May the Lord bless the readers, hearers, and especially the doers of his holy and divine word. I want to see you. As I journey through this land, singing high, I go wanting so to carry through the prayer. Some flow in the air, roof pierce my soul from without within.
come into this house uh, to magnify the Lord and to worship him because he's worthy to be praised. But someone once reminded us that we could have been dead sleeping in our grave but because of the grace and the mercy of God he made death behave one more time and we ought to be thankful. It's good to be here on this morning at this great congregation New Golden Heights Church of Christ. I'm always humbled for the opportunity to stand before you all as well as before the men of God and others that are here. God bless the angel of this house, Dr. W. Washington, for his continued strength and his health. Bless his lovely wife and her health and strength as well. Let's continue to be prayerful for the man of God that he too may continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand. We shall not be long on this morning, but we believe that there is a word from the Lord for the people of God. And thereby, we're grateful again for the opportunity. We're going to ask if you're able to, to stand with us as we read the scripture that we shall be preaching from on this morning. If you're strong enough in your legs, if God bless you with enough strength in your knees, if you're able to. Join me in Mark chapter 5, focusing on verses number 1 through 10. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Before me, I have the New International Version. If you have a reliable translation, it should not differ significantly. Once again, Mark chapter 5, uh, particularly verses 1 through 10. Mark, the gospel writer, declares in verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out the boat, the man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him uh, anymore, not even with chains. Verse 4, for he had been chained hand and foot, but, there, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. The Bible says, night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. Verse 8, for Jesus I said to him, come out of the man, you evil spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion. He replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of, out of the area. Let's jump back quickly to verse 3 of the text. The Bible declares this man lived in the tomb. No one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. Be seated, brothers and sisters. The grass withers, the flower fades away. The word of God will stand forever. Our sermonic theme on this morning, write it down, is living in the tombs. Living in the in the tombs. Losing a dear loved one can be both complicated and emotional. The feeling, brothers and sisters, of suddenly having a person with you one day and not with you the next day 
or sometimes some would say the same day, can be difficult. There is a certain energy or euphoria that a person feels when he or she deals with death, sorrow, pain, and suffering. We all have at one time or another dealt with the emptiness of bereavement. Oh, what a feeling it is. To say your last goodbyes or to see a person that you love lifeless without the ability to no longer feel another hug, another kiss, or even another embrace. Or what a feeling it is to have to rationalize with no longer hearing the other voice on the other side of the phone the knock at the door, the conversations, and even the occasional disagreements. Or what a feeling it is to know that your phone would never ring again from the number or see the chair that once was occupied, now vacant on holidays, on birthdays, on graduations, on weddings, on birth of newborns, and even at church services. Oh, brothers and sisters, what a feeling hear the person's voice in your head, but not truly in your ear. Or to pack their clothes to give them the goodwill or to give it to a person in need. Or what a feeling it is to no longer taste the food that they cook or to hear the stories of the old times or to hold that hand to walk down the street. Or what a feeling to have to rationalize saying goodbye See you later, or I'll see you on the other side, and not, not this side. But church, I must be honest this morning that death is tough, and it is a lot to unpack. And brothers and sisters, it is through prayer and supplication that God has given us this word this morning in the midst of other sermons. Because quite frankly, many of us, watch this, are living we haven't been alive since our loved one pressed a dying pillow. Many of us haven't slept for months. We haven't been on vacations in years. And therefore, God this morning briefly has given us perhaps this word for somebody to help us to know that there is a bright side somewhere. The songwriter encourages us, don't you stop until you find it. There is a bright side somewhere. Losing a loved one is one of the most distressing and unfortunately common experiences that people face. Most people experience normal grief and bereavement, have a period of sorrow or numbness or even guilt or anger. Gradually, these feelings ease and it is said it is possible to accept the loss and to move forward. For some people, feelings of loss are debilitating and don't improve even after time passes. Brothers and sisters, briefly, this is known as what they would call complicated grief. Sometimes it's called persistent complicated bereavement disorder. It is quickly in complicated grief, Brother Snell, that painful emotions are so long-lasting and severe that, that you have trouble recovering from the loss and resuming to your own life. Different people follow different paths through the grieving experience. The order is said that one, number one, accepts the reality of the loss. Two, they allow themselves the experience of pain and loss. Thirdly, they adjust to the new reality in which the deceased is no longer present and thereby having to build other relationships. These differences are normal. If you're unable to move through these stages more than a year after the death of a loved one, they would say one is dealing with complicated grief. Because time is not my friend this morning, I want to dive into our text. Because this man in the text, one would debate or say he's living in the tombs. This familiar passage, heavenly 
preached passage, Mark 5, has been preached as a man that is rebellious. It's been preached that this man is angry. This man is uncontrollable. It's been preached that this man has rage. However, as we attempt to adjust our spiritual lens this morning, perhaps, here it is, this man is grieving. He may be in bereavement and he simply, watch this, can't move forward in life. Consider this man is dwelling in complicated grief. Get this, he sits at the tomb every day. He lives among the tombs. He walks literally around the area where people once cried. He lives in the area where death has been identified. And here it is, he has never left. He sees people come and go to bury their loved ones, watch this every Saturday, but he never leaves. He has endless supply of cleanness. He, he has endless supply of graveyard songs and flowers to lay at the, at the tombs. Quite frankly, brothers and sisters, he's been dealing with this environment so long, you'll see it, God's spirit has left this place. Thereby the Bible declares an evil spirit has taken hold of him. Someone once said that grieving is necessary passage and a difficult transition to finally letting go of sorrow. It is not a permanent rest stop. Jesus in verse 1 of the scripture says in verses, the Bible says they went across Lake of the region of the Gerasenes. That's what Gerasenes means, those who come from pilgrimage, and it also means fight. Many New Testament manuscripts refer to this as the country of the Gerasenes or the Gerasenes rather than the Gerasenes. Both Gerasa and Gadara were sitting to the east of the Sea of the Galilee and the River of Joy. Jesus has now come over, and come over church to the other side of the lake, the place where clearly, watch this, a fight is happening. I contend this man is not angry, but sad. I contend he's not a killer, but overly cares. I contend that he's not a murderer or a thief, he's going through brokenness inside and it shows on the outside. Is this for anybody on this morning? The, the five stages of grief is declared to be denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The question arises is, is he stuck at denial? Is he Stuck at anger, is he stuck at bargaining, depression, or even acceptance? He has stopped and stayed in the tombs. He doesn't have any life. He, he doesn't smile. He, he doesn't have a lot of joy. The Bible declares in verses number two, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, the Bible says a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs to meet him. Verses three this man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Point number one, at the cemetery, there is an encounter, brothers and sisters, of hope and hopelessness. Like a clash or a confrontation between two, watch this, there is a need for a decision. Let me park here parenthetically to help us to see that in life we will always have an opportunity to make a decision. Am I going to move forward by faith or am I going to sit in misery? Am I going to transcend into believing that God will make a way somehow or am I going to allow myself to reside in the seat of sorrow, depression, and nonchalant behavior? It is in essence that this man in some degree has made a decision to not move past 
plaster tombs, but to abide there, to live there, to dwell there, to hang out there. And perhaps many of us, if we're not careful, can find ourselves because life has dealt us a bad hand or life has caused us to not get what we want to get instead of moving forward by faith and walking by faith and not by sight. Some of us may have lingered and, and labored in the spot of sadness and depression and we haven't been able to move forward in life. This, this, this man, like many people, is dwelling in a space where no one lives, where no one abides. He, he dwells in a sad place. The text declares that it's this man who's dealing with this brokenness. He has to make a decision about the circumstance. We can choose to decide everything is going to be all right. We can choose to decide that I can't go on with life. The Bible declares to us in the spirit in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 13 and 14, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Choosing hope helps us through it with strength and not going through it without strength. Quickly, the Bible says he lives amongst the tombs like a mausoleum. This man goes to bed and he wakes up still in the tombs. He positions himself to eat there, to sleep there, to use the bathroom there. He, he, he walks around there, Sister Bess. He even makes decisions there. Therefore, the text says quickly, an evil spirit has met him there. The name of the spirit is Legion Many. It was common in usage that the Legion was the largest unit in the Roman army. And, and at, at that time, a Legion averaged about 5,000 fighting men. It could have been thousands more or fewer. But the term Legion refers to a large number of beings or multitude. The text says this man lived in the tombs and, and no one could bind him anymore. Nobody can even hold him down with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot but he tore the chains apart church and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. There were attempts to help him get better, to assist him with composure and bringing him back to wholeness, which comes the word bind. The text says he couldn't be bind or brought together, not even with a chain. There were suggestions for counseling, but to no avail. There were suggestions to get part of a grief group, but to no avail. There were suggestions to go with friends and take a vacation to no avail. There were suggestions to talk to the preacher, to the pastor, to the minister, and to let them pray with you and pray over you but for your strength, but to no avail. The Bible says nobody could bind him. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Here it is that there are often people in our life that are trying to help us, to pray for us and to move forward us and some of us can testify that, that there are people that have attempted to help us to move methodically to the area of better and hopefulness but somewhere or another we have relegated ourselves, some people to live in hopelessness and there I say this complicated grief but the point that it declares in verse 5 says night and day they among the tombs. This, he, he was in the hills and he could he would cry out 
here's the interesting part, he would cut himself. He would do it to himself. Nobody got to do it to him. He does it to himself, and he cuts himself with stones. Here's a point I want you to keep in mind in the tombs. There is only a cry and a cut. The cry summons help, but here is the antithetical operation. He, but the constant cutting doesn't allow healing. So although he cries, he still opens up fresh wounds. Although he says, I want to be helped and I wish I can have a better day, this action does not display his verbal statements. The what he says does not matriculate to his body to move in the direction in essence than what his mouth says. For example, many of us uh, have a form of godliness, but we deny the power. We, we say we believe in God. We say God is going to make a way. We, we say that I know God is going to fix it. We say that I'm going to trust in the Lord, but somewhere what we say does not come to our actions and, and thereby we cry to God Lord I need you Lord I believe in you but yet we stop praying yet we don't come to worship yet we don't get on our knees yet we don't love God and so there becomes a conundrum or a quagmire in this verse that says although this man cries he still cuts himself opening up his wounds and thereby he never heals never gets better you ever met someone who say, man, I just wish I can get better, but they keep doing the opposite of what better does. And I wish I could lose some weight, but I am keep eating these honey buns. <laughs> keep drinking all of this soda and <laughs> eating late at night. I want to do it, but I keep opening up fresh wounds. I'm almost out of the way, church, but it's in this place it's a battle. Many may ask, how is it, brother, hitting the battle? Because, don't miss this, because joy isn't being found. Peace isn't being found here. Gentleness isn't being found. Only thing we see in the text is pain and suffering. As a result, verse 6, Bible says when Jesus still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him. Some translation says he fell on his knees in front of him. It is in essence that this man is fighting. Of course, we see in the text there is legion, many. But somewhere is a gateway of one thing and another. Because whether you know it or not, sometimes when you allow one thing to occur, it becomes a gateway into other things. Because you don't love yourself, you have a hard time loving others. Thereby, you don't have any friends. As a result of that, your relationships are damaged. And to some degree, you live all alone. The point I'm making this morning in haste is that we as people of God, if we're going to trust God, got to move forward by faith. Because watch this, this man is in the tomb. What does the tomb represent, brother? In his environment. Everybody say environment. Your, your environment affects your elevation. It affects even your energy. Your, your environment is important. Who or where are you lingering? Where do you hang around? Who do you talk to on the phone? What is your circle? Or who are you in your circle? Because quickly he's in the tombs, his environment. The text says he's cutting himself, which determines his healing. He, his environment determines his healing. And the Bible says he couldn't be kept in captivity, thereby because of its environment determining his healing, it affects his progress in life. 
Your environment determines your healing and your progress in life is really what Mark is saying. Jesus, when you look at the text, came for one man, and when the one man was healed, Christ got back on the board and went back to where he came from because whether you know it or not, Jesus always, watch this study it one day, in Scripture takes time when he finds sick men. We see many sick women, although the woman touches the hem, but when Jesus sees a sick man, he stops. Because just the men need to be healed. The Lord wants strong men, not weak men. Somebody say amen to that. He wants men to be strong. Here's the closing of the thought in the text and the sermon. Is that this man is a son. Might even be a father. Might even be a brother. Somewhere else, he's living in the tombs. Stuck. Where he is. Somebody today is stuck. Where they are. Somewhere or another, you stopped thanking God. You stop worshiping. You, you, you stop praising God. You, you've not stopped believing in your prayers. Somewhere or another, somebody this morning is stuck. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Psychologically, emotionally, even mentally, you're stuck. You, you're stuck somewhere because something may in your life has happened or you have believed a lie, and, and as a result of that, it has affected your progress. This reminds us in our closing that even Jesus had a chance to give up. When you read scripture, the Bible says one day Christ had to go to the garden of Gethsemane. It was literally in this garden that Christ has a battle between should I do it or should I not? For he declares to the Father, Lord, God, remove this cup from me, but, but not my will. Let your will be done. Christ himself had to deal with a battle in life as do we. And the Lord, because of his belief, knowing that things are going to work out, was able to overcome the, the sadness, the depression. And even though it was painful, going up the hill of Golgotha, he did it for you and I. And on this morning, somebody has to make a decision. Am I going to allow myself to live in misery or am I I going to look to the master for my healing, for my direction, for my transformation, for my salvation? Am I going to allow myself to stop sitting on the seat of do nothing and begin to walk by faith and not by sight? Somebody on this morning has a decision to make. A decision to make that you're no longer going to allow yourself to stay where you are. When the great song said, you got to learn how to cry your last tear yesterday. But nevertheless, somebody needs to be saved today. You, somebody is walking contrary to their walk with God. In essence, you're not a child nor a servant of God. Jesus says, come to me. Oh, you that labor and heavy laden. I want to give you rest. Not the bottle, not the drugs, not the club, not, not, not the, 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 the corner stuff. Christ says, you may sleep, but, but I want to give you rest. Say, I want to be the one for you. And, and you got to make a decision, my brother, my sister, this morning, not tomorrow, not next week. You got to make a decision. I need to give my life to Jesus. You got to make that decision. You, you got to stop letting the devil hold you down. When I was younger, they used to sing a song, uh, don't let the devil ride. If you let him ride, he ain't going to want to tell you how to drive. Anybody heard that before? Somebody on this morning, brother, sister, you got a decision to make. We want you to walk down these aisles because you need Jesus. You come to him by hearing his word. Hearing Jesus. Listening to what he says. I know you want to hear the pastor, but, but you got to learn how to listen to the master. 
your God. I would say the Romans 10, 17 is so then faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. It is through the word of God that we can transcend evil, can, we can become better people. On your road to salvation, you've got to hear God. You've got to believe what you've heard. You've got to believe it. And most people may say, well, all I've got to do is believe and I'm saved. Well, the Bible doesn't say it. The Bible says in James 2, verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So belief alone is not enough. No, you got, you got to do what the demons don't do. That's repent. And you say, Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, but unless you repent, you're going to all likewise perish. Even where you are, you can hear where you are, you can believe where you are, you can repent where you are. We, we ask you to come forward to take that confession. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Making that confession, we'll baptize you today for the remission and forgiveness of the sins. The Bible said Acts 2.38 and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to wait till tomorrow to come to Christ. This is a great day to come to Jesus. I know you came here just to fellowship but it's your chance to find favor in God's sight. You come to him today because somebody's broken, somebody's defeated, somebody has been allowing themselves to, to not be strong. And it's okay to admit that you got a problem, but the next step is what you're going to do about it. Maybe you need to be saved. Come. Come. Come now. The person next to you, you're, you're nervous, you're nervous wreck. Tap me and say, I need you to walk with me because no man knows the day nor the hour. Nobody knows when the trumpet shall sound. This is the clarion call for you to come to Jesus. Come to him today before it's time and everlasting too late. Oh, my brother, sister, maybe you need prayer. We want to pray for you. Come now if you need prayer. Prayer for brokenness. Everybody stand on your feet if you need prayer for healing, prayer for strength. I know somebody this morning needs prayer. You, we don't always have it together, and that's okay because we got a God that has all power in his hands. Come forward now so that we can pray for you, pray with you. Maybe you're going through trouble in your way. You got to cry sometimes. This is uh, the change. But the Bible said the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous of Dallas much. I'm done. I'm finished. But I want to encourage you to say, learn how to place your care before God. Allow the Lord to move you out of the tombs. Some of us live in the tombs of regret. Tombs of neglect, the tombs of I wish I would have or could have, I ought to have did it. But, but, but God is a person that can begin to forgive today so that we can have a brighter side tomorrow. The song is about to be sung, Will You Come to Christ? Come right now. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Will you come to Jesus today? You can still come. You can still come. You got to trust God today because you got to know that trouble don't last always. Trouble don't last always. Come now. There's more room for more. There's more room for more. You don't got to walk by yourself. God's like David said, he ain't though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll be with you. Hey, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll be your strength. God is calling somebody today.
God is good, and his mercy endures forever. It is through this word that God has given us to say that there are those that have come today, as they all have stated to me, for prayer. You see, church, we are living in difficult times, and dealing with difficult people, and if you don't know by now, prayer changes things. And there's still time for somebody else to come up for prayer, because we're going to be praying with these young ladies and young men and little children. You don't have to worry about the faces, but we're going to be saying a prayer because God knows. God knows what each of them are going through and troubling their way. you got to cry sometimes. And maybe there's someone here today that has asked about forgiveness of sin. Let me see your hand and trust that God will forgive you of your sin as well. I know we're living in a time of sickness, but if to make haste, we're going to ask each of them to hold hands if they're able to, knowing that God can fix it after a while. Amen. And if you're able to, next to you, to hold somebody's hand, that would be great. For prayer is a God is more than neighbor. Y'all believe that? Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, we thank you for all you have done and all that you will do in our lives. We pray. God, you be with us so far. Father, realize, oh, Lord, sometimes the going get tough and the way get rough. But God, we trust you, even those that are standing here today, knowing that you're able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all we ask, all we think. God, we pray today that you continue, Lord, to be with those of asking prayer, God, some for healing, some for their family, some for strength. Some asking in prayer, God, for a, great, a better diagnosis in their health. Father, there also are some here that are dealing with loss of love and bereavement, with trouble, oh, Father. Lord, we we know not, but Lord, you know all. God, we pray that you continue, Lord, to cover them, oh Father, that you allow your blood to heal them, that you keep them forever strong and faithful to you, and help us, oh Lord, to continue to know no matter what we go through, we can keep trusting in you, even when we may not track you. God, we pray that you continue, Lord, to be with each person that's under the sound of our voice as we hold the hand, oh Lord, be with the hand that we're holding. Father, bless their family, bless their health, bless their strength, keep them forever faithful to you. God, we pray that we can always give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. This is our prayer. This is our plea. In the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, all those that love the Lord will say and shout amen. Amen. How concerned the collection for the saints. As I give an order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in the store, as God has proffered him, that there be no gathering when I come. 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verses 1 and 2. As we prepare to give as God has prospered us, let us pray. Almighty God, as we come to you, Father, here in the heart. Thank you for the great opportunity to worship thee with our giving. We pray this time, Father, that we will give not grudgingly or of necessity, for we know you love us, a cheerful giver. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have two collections this morning. The first will be for our general offering and lay by and the media ministry. The second will be a love offering for Brother Hill.
This would be a love offering for Brother Henry. Let us give thanks for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you by here in the hall, thanking you for the offering that you have raised. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that this money will be used for your honor and for your glory. And we pray for the love offering for Brother Hinton. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that it will encourage him to continue to stand firm in his faith. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Over 2,000 years ago, The marvelous, magnificent Jesus, who left the richest coats in glory and came to this lowland of sorrow. and found it wallowing in the cesspool of immorality. Identified with man and the human condition and made himself poor. So poor that he said, the birds of the air have nests, and the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Leaving the hall of Pilate, He made his way to the hilltop of Golgotha. And because of the purpose of God, from before the foundation of the world, he paid a price. He let them kill him. Mm -hmm. For he had already made known that nobody takes my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I lay it down. Yeah. 
And because of that Ely Masonary spirit, and because of his humbleness, and because of his humanitarianism on the part of mankind himself, including us, he let them crucify him. But if he had not done it, we would be men and women in this world most miserable. And so today, as every first day of every week, we meet in this auditorium in a public way as brothers and sisters to participate in what we call the Lord's Supper. This is the koinia of God. This is the koinia of the Savior. Now you and I are going to participate in, in this supper as sisters and brothers. Humanistically, I'm not related to anybody here. But we are related in Christ. We are brothers and sisters. And so we come now to the table of fellowship We come now, all of us, in the presence of God. For he looks down upon us and he sees whether or not we are doing what he asks us to do. And he said, I want you to take this bread and when you Take it and break it. It's going to represent my broken body. And I want you to take this cup. And when you take this cup, the contents therein is going to represent my shedded blood. So I want you to do it. in remembrance of me. So the eyes of God looks down upon us here in this auditorium as we as feeble human beings capable of making mistakes and do make mistakes but we rejoice in the fact that we have the blood of Jesus that continually cleanses us on our request. And so today, as brothers and sisters, at the table of fellowship, you and I are going to take off this bread and drink of this cup. And it becomes, if not the central or the central biblical ritual that we perform in the presence of God. And it should be transforming. It is as powerful, it is more powerful than what takes place 
in the waters of baptism. And so you and I now as brothers and sisters are going to participate in this meal and we're going to do it together. And we're going to do it in love. And as we do it, we're going to remember that were it not for Jesus, who died out yonder on that old rugged cross, if it were not for him and what he did, we would be men and women in this world most miserable. Let us therefore now remove as best we can from our minds all of our cares, all of our worldly cares, and seek to remember that on that distant day, out yonder on the old rugged cross, and if we would listen carefully, we would hear the nails as the soldiers drove them in his feet. If we are careful, you will hear the hammers as they rang out through Jerusalem street killing the Lord of glory who refused to come down off that cross. And we thank him today for paying a debt we could not pay. We thank him for saying yes to the cross. So we are going to now take this bread and we're going to remember Jesus. We're going to take this cup and we're going to remember Jesus. Otherwise, it would be insignificant and anticlimactic. So let's go to the cross as brothers and sisters and let's fellowship together. In this great meal as we remember Jesus. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same man also he took the cup, and he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. First Corinthians the eleventh chapter, twenty-third to the twenty-sixth verse. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you with our heads and our hearts, thanking you for the perfect gift of Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And as we commemorate what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary, hung, bled, and died for the sins of the world, that we all may have a right to eternal life, we pray that thou would bless this bread, which represents his broken body, 
and bless the cup, which represents his shed blood. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Together now we will take the bread. And together we will drink the cup. Church said amen. 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 Amen, again. amen again. God bless. We have some visitors this morning, Reginald. At this moment, we're going to recognize our visitors. And thank you for being with us. I want to uh, remember now our weekly services. I'm sure it's been announced. If not, uh, we want to remember our Bible study Wednesday evening. We want to remember 5 o'clock this evening worship service. Brother Henson did an excellent job this morning, and we thank God for him. And we look forward again at 5 o'clock to hear him again. And it's just good to see all of you. Uh, several of our members are